They'll turn it on, Kelsey. <laughs> I like that little dance. <laughs> speaker for you, but first let me tell you about all the impressive things you can discover about Dr. Nick Bowman from his CV, okay? So Dr. Nick Bowman earned his BA and MA from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, received his PhD from MSU in nine-ish, ten-ish. He's currently an associate professor at Syracuse University Newhouse School of Public Communications. Uh. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, where's Tommy? There's just got to um, Dr. Bowman's research is broadly focused on understanding cognitive, emotional, physical, and social demands of interactive media content. He's published more than 125 peer-reviewed manuscripts, over 200 conference presentations, several dozen book chapters, <laughs> and a handful of books, including um, a new handbook of media entertainment, expected in 2023, non-sponsored plug. <laughs> he has won numerous teaching and research awards. He was named a Fulbright Taiwan Wu Jingji Arts and Culture Fellow in the spring of 2020. He was editor in chief for communication research reports from 2017 to 2019 and is the current editor in chief of the Journal of Media Psychology and an associate editor of the registered reports for the Journal of Technology, Mind, and Behavior. So if you're not already impressed, which maybe you should be, let me tell you a few things that you may not find on his CV, but you might find it on Twitter. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Dr. Bowman is quite possibly the most social person in the communication discipline, which is quite maybe a feat. Uh, if you can't find him at the next ICA or NCA, uh, you can look for one of two things. So first, you're kind of people who actually look happy to be there. <laughs> or second, the vest and scarf combo. Yeah. Let me say, when I wrote this, I wasn't expecting a tie. Okay? Uh, but neck apparel may be, may be worse. All jokes aside, Dr. Bowman has always been an advocate for our program. Um, his pride in this department and in this university has quite literally reached around the world. Uh, we are so incredibly lucky to have him here today as our speaker for the Charles K. Atkin Speaker Series. You know him, you love him. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bowman. <laughs> Thank you for that, and I have to reveal a couple of things that might surprise people in this room. I'm normally known for being fairly confident, and I have been a bit nervous today. I, I feel like I'm defending my dissertation again. <laughs> and there's like this slight twinge that that like, number could go away if something goes wrong. <laughs> and I usually have plenty to talk about. That doesn't shock many people. And I'm actually stumbling at my words a little bit today. I've actually been a little quiet and coy around the building as I had this nostalgia flood coming back that I, I wasn't expecting. And um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to work through <laughs> 15 or so years of research that I it never was planned as a line of work. You find things that interest you, and you follow up with those things, and you find new things, and then those things are interesting, and then you follow up with them. And when you look back, like when you go up for promotion and tenure, you are forced to tell a story. So if it doesn't fit a narrative, it better fit a regression line now, because <laughs> you're going in front of a board. And it talks like this. It's like, all right, now what do you really do? I'm like, oh. And so I've been going through these papers, and I'm reading my own work, and I'm realizing how much of your own work you forget. Yeah. You read a paper, and you're like, I don't, I made that clear. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm putting it back into this narrative. And I'm not done yet. And I mean it when I say that a lot, this work came from fear. It came from being lost. It came from leaving a job in media and moving to Michigan, to which my parents replied, so you have a college degree. And, and you, have a, you live on your own. You don't live here. <laughs> Why are you going back to college? <laughs> You don't have to do that. You already have done this thing. To figuring out we can do social science research on these phenomena that we often are so mundane we don't think about them, but yet they're so powerful. 
I mean, the folks then who study entertainment face this conundrum. When someone goes, what do you study? I'm like, television and games and entertainment. And they go, har, har, har. I'm like, yeah, but you spend a good third of your day with this stuff. And if you read the headlines, what are you concerned about? What are you arguing about? What are we arguing over? Where are the policy debates coming from? Right? So I'm going to talk a bit about that journey and connect it to my research and close by essentially soliciting more research from you, from me, from us. There is nothing else I enjoy as collaboration. It's one reason I've moved a little bit. I haven't always been able to find collaborators. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'm going to talk about video games as this interactive medium that, I don't know, it fascinates me. I mean, as a kid down in the basement grabbing a controller and realizing that I have some control over this. I don't have control over a whole lot. Right, but I can control this for these couple of minutes. I can push these buttons, I can do these things. I can win or lose, I can be frustrated, I can be happy. And I guess I had the privilege of growing up to watch games become increasingly complicated. Four bit, eight bit, 16 bit, 3D, gloves, goggles, treadmills. And I'm getting to the point where I don't like it and I'm shaking my fist. The games are too complicated today. <laughs> But what I'm noticing in the development of the technology is, of course, the tech is developed, and then the user experience is supposed to be part of that technology development, and it isn't always part of that development. And now we're getting to this multi-billion dollar industry where we're making all these amazing, immersive, interactive, et cetera, et cetera, experiences, and we're not quite sure what the users do with those anymore. Um, they're kind of spread all over the place. And I sometimes wonder if we're putting too much pressure on the player, on the user, and if we're matching up what we intended to design with what they're experiencing. And I talk about this in terms of demand with an intentionally negative connotation. Maybe we're asking for things that the user didn't agree to when they put that game in or turned on that program. And it might be leading to outcomes that you weren't expecting. Or it could lead to better outcomes if it was balanced better. And I'm going to cop out when I close and say that we're still working on it. But we are still working on it. Okay, I'm going to come back to all of this. So, <laughs> Well, I love that you did that because I, this is the first slide that I made, and I actually got a little emotional making it. I tried to find the overhead. I'm like, somewhere online, there's got to be that fourth grade overhead of the United States that I can find. Right? I almost emailed the department saying, can you give me a copy of the overhead? So I was born in Arkansas in Conway to an immigrant father and a mother from a broken Italian household. And they just sort of figured it out, and we moved to St. Louis. And I never thought I would leave. UPS had just opened a facility to drive a truck for like 30 bucks an hour, and that's pretty neat. And I went to college because I didn't want to work part-time at night. And I sort of really enjoyed journalism, and I went to graduate school after that because I wanted to, frankly, make myself more marketable in a media career. And I took a course on media at Dr. Hollis Hall, and didn't like it. But I'm like, I work in the media. Those theories don't. Come on, you don't know. You don't work in a newspaper. I work in a newspaper. And I learned very quickly that she was right. <laughs> there was a lot of theory. Whether you know theory or not, it still exists. It still influences you. So it's a lot better if you can get in front of it and figure out some of these, you know, um, descriptive, predictive, explanatory, controlling features of our social world. And I put 2.5 up here because I went to Chicago for NCA. And I met a couple of folks in this dark hotel room with lots of bottles of non-alcoholic and alcoholic beer mm -hmm. talking about research that I had just learned a couple of weeks ago. And it was the Michigan State reception. And I met up with a lot of faculty, John Sherry and Ron Tamburini and Dave Westerman, uh, students, uh, Mike Katowski. And they were all talking about media research and, and, and Paul Skalski was there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know people studied this stuff. I didn't know they studied it and cared about it enough to talk about it over beer at night. <laughs> then they make fun of each other. And then they talk about the research some more. And so I started talking to them, and I talked to Ron, and I talked to John. And before you know it, I, I put an application in, and I, I came to East Lansing. And I didn't quite know what I was doing there, and I'll get to where I went from there eventually. That's going to be the meat of the conversation. So I, I come here. I really transform as a scholar, as a person. I didn't give it a valence. That's up to you to decide. <laughs> and took a job on a black bear reservation at a school of 800 people in North Georgia because I decided to go on the market in 2009. And so you can go back and follow the economics of that time. Um, 
went up the Appalachian Trail to West Virginia University, spent about a decade there. That's where I did my tenure. It's where I built my first lab. It's where I really got to get the ball rolling. Never thought I would leave, frankly. It's a nice, uh, confident R1 near Pittsburgh, fun town, lovely place. And I looked for a new opportunity out west, and I moved right back over here. In the middle of all of that, I went over to Germany. And so my German colleagues are thinking, why is Turbingia highlighted on a map of Germany? Why would an American go to this, like, you know, it's this effort of all the cities? It's not the one we've heard of. I spent some time in Taipei uh, as a Fulbright scholar, and now I'm actually down the road with a slightly different S. Slightly? <laughs> if you look real close, this is a square, and that's a rectangle. <laughs> And when they both <coughs> used white ones, that really throws me off. I'm like, all right, listen, it's too far. Right? I'm down the road, I'm going around the corner, and I'm really happy to be back here. So when I first got to Michigan State, they threw me into a lab. John Shearer was running a study on sex differences in cognition and video games. And I didn't know what any of those things meant except video games. And what I learned through the research is what he was trying to figure out is whether or not generic, cog generalized cognitive abilities, mental rotation ability, hand-eye coordination, verbal skills, certain abilities that we know have some biological differences um, would correlate and predict gameplay. So for example, you might expect your ability to rotate 2D objects in your head and see them in 3D and select the proper rotations is very similar to how you would navigate a flat screen in three-dimensional space, which is essentially a shooting game. And we didn't use a shooting game, we actually used a, a maze and a ball, but I couldn't find it anywhere online. It's been quite a while. Um, and we found that these uh, generalized cognitive skills were predictive of performance, and if you control for game skill, the sex difference went away. Because the brain, the brain is pliable. You can work those regions over time, and then you work through this. Right? This was never published, but it's what sent me to Germany the first time for ICA 2006, in the world's hottest conference center. For those who win. <laughs> um, yeah. But it got me thinking about how people engage games and not just as that thing I did when I was mad at mom and dad or getting away from college, although we're gonna come back to that one too. So this gets me thinking about gaming, about, about some of the um, personological differences that get into gaming. And then I start attaching my research to my coursework and trying to find those intersections. And so 802, we're talking about different social theories that might explain behaviors. I learned about social facilitation theory. This idea that, like right now, when people are watching you and they're around you, you try a little harder, which can work really well in your favor if the dominant response to that, to that drive is going to facilitate performance. It can also make you fall on your butt. And again, we still have a lot, quite a while, so we'll see. You know, I didn't know that this was a training field for adoptable education at a large Midwestern institution. But it worked out, and what we found out in the study is an experiment brought people into a lab. We had them play video games in the John Miller lab, either by themselves or in front of other people. We gave them a uh, cognitive skills battery, where we did mental rotation tests, you know, uh, a fixed eye ability, moving eye ability. We had some axe handles glued to the ceiling of the John Miller lab with little Velcro circles and an underhand motion, you would hit them with a tennis ball. That actually correlates to your performance as a 3D, a 3D shooter, because you have to be able to move a target and, and shoot it. Chuck's face, when I was throwing things at people, if you walk by the ladder, there's tennis balls everywhere. And to explain why my receipts all came from Home Depot. <laughs> my research. Um, we used the cracker, the, the Purdue pegboard test, but I couldn't afford the Purdue pegboard test. So I had Cracker Barrel Square. <laughs> measure how fast you could put the little pegs in and take the little pegs back out. Uh, high, motor, uh, high motor skill. And then catching the rulers falling from the ceiling. And the paper explains how all these generalized cognitive abilities would be predictive of performance in a 3D environment. And it turns out rotation ability and hand-eye targeting were predictive. And when the game was easy, so was audience presence. Do it. Being in front of people triggered that effort, which triggered those cognitive abilities, which went right into the video game. And of course, when the game is hard, the audience effect is lost. And one of the reasons that the game is already pretty hard, and your skill is already taking over. Where I'm going with all this, of course, is that we're identifying other things the game requests of you, requires of you, to perform the task in front of you. 
stepped into 992, a seminar on entertainment theory, which has been quite formative in my career, frankly. We had Peter Borders, a guest speaker, and Art Rainey, and Mary Beth Oliver. I think I also found the syllabus recently. We were kind of going through this like kind of golden course that we took as students. And I came across two articles that really stuck with me. And one was by Chuck on our learned expectations of entertainment these days that we can learn this utilitarian role that certain messages play to seek out specific needs. And the other one, well, <laughs> I think I, I, I may have made Ron mad because I got into an argument with James Bryant about, <laughs> my um, home. He's like, <laughs> I didn't know it was James Bryant, that's the best part. I'm like, some guy talking about this theory that I read last week. So <laughs> 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 and it turns out he's Jennings, a great guy if you ever got a chance to meet him. <laughs> we did become very close friends. My first encounter, I got onto him because he didn't study video games. And his response was, Nick, this was published in 1985. <laughs> if you want to study video games, you should just do that. And then write your version. I was like, it's not bad advice. <laughs> and then Ryan's like, do you know that? It's like, I do. Um, <laughs> But I put these two things together. They resonated with me. I have these documents on my computer. I've got the printed out versions. And I really wanted to see, OK, what are we learning about games from our prior exposure? This thing called intervention potential, the ability for a message to absorb your attentional resources to distract you from the root cause of your negative moods, that to me just sounded like interactivity. I mean, if you've ever tried to play a video game and do something else, it's really, really hard. And so I really got to thinking that if we can control other features of the game, boy, when I got to sit down and focus and push these buttons and, and really zone in, that should get my mind off of things. And so I put together the world's stupidest perspectives. <laughs> um, this is an induction for bewilderment, because I saw my committee try not to explode as I proposed this within subjects, 20 minutes, measure a bunch of things I made up last week, and then we'll, oh, we'll just bring people in the lab for a week straight, every single day, Monday through Friday. We'll give them extra credit, of course they'll come, and they'll come play games on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and fell out my scales, and I'll, I'll graduate on time. And Ron did say before Halloween 2008, you really shouldn't propose this. I think it's a bit much. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm dead set that this is going to be my, you know, look, my, my prelim went so well. It did go well. It was in media psychology. Well, this obviously would be nature. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they beat me up pretty bad. Uh, I forgot Occam's Razor. I forgot the other philosophy of science books and my logic and reasoning. Who was on your idea. committee? Ron? Frank Bio uh, John Sherry, Renee Faber, Frank Bioko. Yeah. And they just had exchanged <laughs> eyes at each other and then at me, and then probably not at me anymore, just at each other. You don't want a silent committee yet. That's not looking good. Um, but we say some things out of it, and I continue to think about demand and interactivity and what is it that games take from us that, that, that changes the experience. We boiled it down to these notions of mood management and mood repair. That if people are in bad moods, you know, we can experimentally induce uh, boredom and anxiety, despite what IRV would tell you. Um, with boredom, you give people a bowl of washers and a like, nearly infinite long piece of string. And you ask them to thread the washers, and they'll come back a little later. And people will do it. <laughs> Lab coat effect. And you measure their heart rate, and it actually drops, and it worked really well. And in anxiety, you give them a GRE type exam, and you tell them that 75% of students at this university have no problem completing this exam, and then you leave the room for 20 oh minutes. Except a little buzzer goes off at 40 seconds, and 190 seconds, and 20 seconds. And we actually made it more stressful now because we give you dry erase markers to do all of your long math on, and all of your word problems, and you flip the markers over. And these inductions work really well. And we wonder, okay, now I've got you bored, and I've got you really stressed out, I should be able to manipulate the intervention potential of this message, how much attention it requires from you. And I realize that word can be used in very different ways. And the more absorbing the, the experience is, the better it should be repairing the mood. And I thought it'd be linear because video games are the greatest thing. Research can be dangerous sometimes. And what we found 
is it's linear to a point, and then it drops down. It's curvilinear because it turns out at really high levels of how much you have to do in the game, it just turns into another point of stress. So this was a flight simulator where you either just watched it to simulate television watching, you had your hands on the controls, but the plane mostly flew itself. You had to control just like the stick and the speed. Everything else is automatic, or you had to control the stick, the speed, the flippers, the switches, the landing gear, the parachutes, the whole shebang. In all of this research, we found in the first study that, in fact, you would see you know, better movie repair, better movie repair, better movie repair, then it would drop off. And then for bored individuals, it was better because, of course, they had a lot less stress and, and arousal in their mood, whereas the game becomes a source of stress and arousal. So we found this non-disordinal interaction, cur non-disordinal curvilinear interaction. I had to learn all those words. <laughs> um, but it was a neat finding, and it's also a reminder that sometimes in two-by-twos you miss things, and you can't really test those curvilinear effects beyond that. This was a neat finding in study one, and in study three, we actually let people choose the game. That was Chuck's part, the learned expectation part. And sure enough, the people's choices they would make about which game they wanted to play after getting a chance to play were more or less in line with the movie repair scores up in study one. Study two is blurred out. I uh, promised Ron when I graduated that this would also get published. And it was, a con it was a coding of people's hands on the controls to see if the amount of movement in their hands was predictive of mood repair. And that data is still sitting on my desk, and it's in a series of those mini disks. <laughs> There's 12 of them. And I, I'm not kidding, it's actually still on my desk with a post-it note on it. But it has been a while. <laughs> so I've not violated my promise yet. But this was something where we found that this intervention potential, this, this focus the game requires, can have this really neat mood repair effect. But it could also be bad for us if it's too much to do. But if you're making a simulator or a game, don't you want the player to do all of it? That's what makes it fantasy. Not really, right? If I don't know how to fly a plane, and you give me a plane that's a one-to-one -one match to a plane, I'm going to crash that one too, or I'm not going to fly that one either. It's every bit as frustrating. So again, it's got me thinking about my research, about whether or not there's, there's something about, can games be too much? Is there some sweet spot in terms of, how much you get involved with the game, however you're defining involvement. So we looked at, you know, after I left, I did some work on uh, interactive stories. You know, the story is co-authored by definition. You make choices, those choices unfold the story and then move through it. I had learned about morality while I was here, right, from many of the folks in this room. And we did a study, although <laughs> Ron's name isn't on this, but I did call him at six in the morning from a diner to ask for some analysis feedback on a paper. We looked at moral salience and, and observed decision making. One of the things we found is that when people have a strong, salient moral uh, uh, foundation, they won't violate that in the game. Um, whereas if their foundations are lower, they won't automatically violate, they just do something. It's, it's, I wouldn't call it random, it's just satisfying. I just wanna see what happens. So it's not moral and immoral, Moral and amoral, we're looking at probabilities. Right? That was kind of neat. There was a biasing factor, but not necessarily. And we replicated some of the research. I think Lindsay did a study where we were able to make it uh, temporarily accessible, uh, looking at the narrative. If you had to help somebody, that might have triggered you temporarily to think about help and, and, and care a little more, right? About fantasy and care. We started seeing a lot of our research looking at narratives in terms of appreciation. So if you don't know much about entertainment research, there was a sort of movement to go beyond enjoyment, beyond arousal and hedonia, and start working in more pensive reactions, uh, more reflective or eudaimonic reactions to media. And we found several across several data points, we were seeing that when people would think about game narratives, they wouldn't necessarily think about enjoyment. They would talk about appreciation, meaningfulness, eudaimonia, deeper reflections. And in the game design research, there had been this shift to talking about above the neck verbs that happen, you know, here, versus below the neck verbs, which were more action oriented. So you think, why would a game be the motion cap of the face? Well, if nonverbals are important. Well, why would nonverbals be important? Well, they might help communicate emotion, communicate closeness. Whereas down here, if I'm making a fighting game, I probably don't need to know much about the person's emotional state. This is just an object that I punch. 
that was kind of interesting. And we saw this across several different data sets, qualitative data, survey data, experimental data. We were finding these associations over again. Controllers are a source of demand. So here is that there's emotional demands in games that go beyond just arousal and fun. Shouldn't surprise a lot of people. There were controllers that were important to the experience, right? And there had been a move, and it still is, for naturally mapped controllers that, that take advantage of a human perceptual system, right? The one-to-one uh, the -one correspondence with the ways that we interact with the world. And I heard that this bowling ball might still be upstairs. Um, we did a study, this is, so, we gave Chuck a receipt for, I think, $500 from the tool and die shop on campus, engineering school. And he's like, well, we've never had to purchase any, what did you do? What did you do, right? We needed a naturally mapped bowling ball for our study, looking at the Nintendo Wii and self-termination theory and, and competence. And the controller is not a bowling ball. And you all know Ron likes to bowl. So after he critiqued my bowling uh, uh, um, stance for a while, went to Michael's and I, I carved out a styrofoam ball that a Wii controller could fit in, that you could put the controller in. And I'm not going to do it because you'll make fun of me, but you would go bowling with your hands. And so we go over to the tool and die shop and we, we hand them, you know, we tell them what we want to do. We want to make a controller where we can snap a Wii controller into a naturally mapped controller for this experiment that we're running. He said, okay, that's great. Where are your schematics? Thinking, you know, piece of paper. And I handed him my styrofoam Michael's ball. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they entertained it. And they made us a device and handed it back because it worked quite well, frankly, in the study. Now, we would have thought that this would have felt more natural, more intuitive with bowling. It actually turns out that a lot of folks report this one is more intuitive. Mm -hmm. Any reason why? So in their mind, it's not bowling, it's gaming. Um. Not to mention, they do better with this one. I've probably done everything from play Jeopardy to slay monsters to surf the internet on, on this device. I mean, its, it's strength is its flexibility. It's intuitive. Uh, I didn't learn the query alphabet. I learned my ABCs. But we've gotten so good at being able to think through this device that was supposed to slow us down. And we don't ask the question, can we type faster? The answer is Dvorak, but what's the point? We have 100 plus years experience with this QWERTY keyboard, right? So we saw these findings over and over again that the industry was making these naturally mapped controls, and they weren't doing very well. That the traditional ones, the handheld ones, the, it's called the golden hands rule of game design. Those were doing better. These are actually seen as paradoxically more demanding, more tricking. They're getting in the way of performance. And if you're trying to design an experience, I don't want to disrupt the performance. I want to enhance the performance. We think it's getting better, but we're still seeing the dominance of that, of that pad at the end of the day. Uh, whether it's through you know, path modding, where we're seeing that naturally intuitive controllers were, were less natural, through qualitative surveys and studies and interviews, we're able to talk about precision, naturalness, comfort. My point is just that this other aspect of the experience also influences what the experience is requiring of me, which is gonna play a role a little later. Of course we are, you know, that the social mechanics of these games matter. We've even done studies where we had people uh, come into a lab, and we, did, we didn't do cyberball, we did the actual ball toss paradigm, where three people, you know, two confederates and a research participant, two confederates play catch with each other, and either ignore or include the research participant to ostracize them. I throw things at people, I ostracize them, I make them put washers on string. And then afterwards, I let them choose what games they wanted to play. And we found that people who uh, were socially included, if they played a game alone, they didn't like it as much. And it was almost the situation where they were expecting more sociality than they were getting out of it. So as long as they were looking for something, didn't get that compared to their other experience. And that became kind of interesting is one data point. We saw that the actors in the games, the avatars, aren't just agents for parasocial relationships where you form a fake relationship and they're not really there. People are forming authentic social relationships that went two ways. 
They would spend time with these characters. They would listen to the characters. They would give the characters what they want. And if you look at an example of this, if, if you have a pet, you know what I'm talking about. Right? It may not be the same sociality as this interaction, but there's this give and take. I have to do things for you. You have a lot of agency over me. And we were seeing this in video games as well, where people are actually engaging with non-humans, which makes sense. If I can create a world with potentially social others, I can engage those people. So I've talked about these things in separate, but remember, so now you've got increasingly more social worlds with increasing different types of interaction types, with increasing different types of controllers, with more and more complicated stories, and you start to wonder where all of this is going to balance out. The individual studies are neat, but what are they going to add up to in terms of the user experience? Because we're slicing up games into really weird fundamental elements and controlling for the rest. But that's not how they exist. Mm -hmm. They exist in a package. So first, before we go any further, we have to be able to measure this stuff. I could yammer all day about my prior findings, but if we can't measure it, the perceptions of these different demand sources, then what are we doing? Like, what are we going to go with this information? So I took the feeling integer model in 2002. Um, I thought, I think, I still think, that there might be at least five sources of demand. And I'm going to go through each one of them here uh, individually. So there's the cognitive. It's the most obvious. It's, I gotta rationalize the system. I gotta learn the logic, I gotta solve the puzzle. It's the one we think about with most games. Otto's gonna help us with this. We have a weird mascot, let's just call it what it is. <laughs> it's just the color orange. What is it? It's just the color orange. Yeah, it's Gruffy's, yeah. It's the orange ball. <laughs> I, they don't pay me enough. <laughs> so we wanna see how to rationalize. How do we measure that? Thinking very hard, mental gymnastics, draw my mental resources, mental challenges, having the impact I played the game, the game stimulated my brain. The ones that are in gray, I'm going to explain that in a minute, they still work just fine, but we've translated this now in five languages, and these are the ones that didn't translate as well. When we went to like Korean and Mandarin and Turkish, they just didn't translate as well in German. But again, these are perceptions. I I'm taking a model, and I should have said that sooner, that I'm not studying the technology. I'm studying the person's perception of their experience with the technology. That's a big fight in the, in the tech field, in the user experience research. The, you know, there's a lot of researchers at another large uh, Big Ten university that like technology is all about the, the interactivities in the technology. It's an objective feature of the device. And I don't deny that, but not everybody can push these buttons. And not everybody knows what they do. And if you ever watch gamers, you might be able to do really good things with the game. You give him the same controller, same game, same experience, and you can't do the same things. And so I'm very interested in the perception side more than the actual buttons on this device. And I feel pretty strongly about that, and there's reasons I could talk about all day. <laughs> then we get to the emotional, this uh, having this affective response to the, to the experience. Okay, sure, we have some data on that. And if we went through all the items <laughs> that came out in our initial analysis, the game tugged at my heartstrings. I was moved, strong emotional bonds, unexpected feelings. And you're probably thinking to yourself, this kind of, the, yeah, the feels. It's a, five languages now. People have the feels. I am as surprised as you are. We generated uh, 20 items per dimension for our initial pool. These are the ones that came out, and the feels is one of them. And it is multicultural at this point. Multilinguistic, I can't say cultural. Critique of this one, of course, it's awfully aligned with the more pensive, deeper emotional states, and it kind of skips over, you know, maybe some more basic emotions, and we can talk about that. What about the physical demands? I gotta touch this thing. Because these first two can happen in lots of media, but I gotta touch this one. I didn't expect it to break into controller and exertional. I thought it would just be physical demands. What we found in the data is that people would focus on the apparatus separately from what I have to actually do with my body. And that becomes relevant in newer interactive systems. If you've used VR, if you've played Beat Saber, if you've done these things. And I think the average VR gaming experience is about 14 minutes long. And there's probably a reason for that. It's tiring. Whereas I could sit down and play Final Fantasy XI for a couple of days, right? <laughs> and it's much more sustainable. 
but the control and most of the control work, natural mapping essentially, perceived intuitiveness. And then the, the exertion is feeling as if you've expended yourself. So these are all coming out. And then of course there's the social actor, and we're careful not to say human, because they're not all human. But they're still social actors in the experiences. In fact, in later research, we're seeing evidence when we analyze our qualitative, our open-ended data, that players seem to want to make a distinction between humans and social actors, but when we look at the survey data, it always collapses back on itself, and so we can explain that. You know, socializing was important, I was aware of others, I was compelled to interact, I felt obligated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we, again, English, German, Mandarin, Taiwanese, um, Turkish, working on Korean now, we're working on translating it for VR now, that worked great. The problem with the first study was all VR games, so it seemed like a kind of cheating. But like you already have a gaming version, so a VR gaming version, shocker, fit. That's congratulations. <laughs> um, so we're working on non-gaming VR applications. I don't like the term, but interactive storytelling. Um, psychophysiological substrates. What are the actual attentional components that underlie and predict these perceptions of demand? That's the project the lab is currently working on. Um, and we're in the middle of spending my startup money to buy that equipment, so that'll be fun. <laughs> it's a good reason to get a job. <laughs> um, summarizing them there. We have done a lot of validation on this stuff, and I'm just going to summarize some of these because this is a little weird. This table is from the Turkish translation paper where we looked at how the demand measures correlated with other things that they should be correlated with. And then, of course, worked correlated with things they shouldn't be correlated with. And the symbology here is telling you the extent to which they're replicating across the other previous uh, validations. And I realize the danger of giving you 30 studies instead of two is I have to go very surface level. It's not a trick that make you think I'm not very good. I'll still answer questions. <laughs> I'm just giving you the top level. So for example, NASA has the task load index that they use for astronauts. You don't want your astronauts overloaded in space. It's a stressful environment. I think. Um, and the task load index, among other things, measures cognitive and exertional demands. Are you fatiguing the astronauts? Can they think through the interface well enough? And sure enough, cognitive demands were, were correlated with NASA TLX scores, and exertional demands were correlated with NASA TLX scores. And the other three weren't, and that's how it should be. They may have been in one study, but not across the multiple replications of this work. Uh, emotional demands, emotional effort. Cognitive demands, cognitive effort. Exertional, physical effort. Social demands, social effort. Single item measures and policies. Again, just showing some discriminant and convergent validity. All right? Emotional demands and appreciation. You would expect that. If I really feel this deeper emotional involvement with the narrative, I should have a higher score on this eudaimonic dimension of media entertainment. Um, narrative ratings and emotional demands. The narratives are what often give the context for the emotional demand. It's the storyline. Controller demands and controller ratings. If the control is more demanding, I hate it. You expect this. Social demands and relatedness. I'm feeling closer to people. And I thought the game was very social. And so, again, I'm skimming the surface here for effect, but the point I'm making is the scale over and over and over again is correlating where it should. It's not 100% perfect, but it's working in the ways we think it should be working. And with that, by the way, those demands, I didn't even show you the EFA, CFA procedures, but even those were replicated three or four times. So we're very confident that those five dimensions are separate. They're, they're oblique, not orthogonal, but they are separate. And we're fairly confident they discriminate between people's discrete evaluations on those dimensions in ways that they should. <laughs> then I met some folks at ACOD, Computers and Human Interaction, who don't read Kong. And I love them because they're probably watching right now. Um, but we had a great conversation about these two research groups in different fields literally stumbled across the same dimensions. They had the Corgus scale and I had the demand scale. And we did what I think a lot of scholars don't often do is we didn't have a Twitter flame war. We just emailed each other. We're like, hey, I see you're working on perceptions of challenge in video games. I'm working on perceptions of demand in video games. I wonder if those are the same thing. That's how I met Jamie, by the way, 
um, it was on a, a, a paper on uh, play avatar interactions. But I wasn't looking to move on, I was just looking to do some more research. So I met with the, the uh, Desisova team over in the UK. We did another study where we took all of our items, gave them out to gamers, asked gamers to recall these certain experiences, fill out the scales, and what we found is that all of the demand dimensions held. And they were pretty strong and they were pretty dominant. But there were these dimensions of Corgis, decision-making and performance, that were independent. What we think happened here is the teams may have been coming at this slightly differently to the extent of, I was measuring what the game takes from me, requires from me. They were measuring how I responded to that. They were measuring what decisions that I make, how did I do in the game, but it was more evaluative. And we're, we're still working on this. It's actually under review right now. But it held up even in the face of other dimensions that could have potentially kind of scrapped some of this work. And I was really proud of that. And the team and I, we still work together even today. We're still working on some of this work. Where are we taking this? Well, this is where I think I want to go eventually. I have not drawn the potential intercorrelations to keep it clean. I don't think demands are actually that important. You might be agreeing. What I mean by that is, it's kind of like presence. That's not the goal of VR. <laughs> That's a thing VR can do. But we care about it because it affects something else. I think that we can start identifying the formal features and characteristics of a game, of a VR experience, that can reliably be seen by audiences as cognitively or emotionally or exertionally or socially demanding which will probably then predict the outcomes better than just looking at this to this. Which is what we all learned here. This is intervening variables, right? This is just stimulus organism response. And a lot of our work in COM focuses on that organism. We, we, we take up the position that that organism, that human, is processing this information and making sense of it, and then reacting to it as a result. So when your chairs or deans want to ask you how video games are communication, that's one answer you can give. Right? That's why I think this work's going to be really important. And I'll give a couple of areas where we're going with this, and then I'll stand to scrutiny afterward. So we did some work on flow and cognitive demands. We were trying to figure out you know, how people who are having that balance of challenge and skill, how they would evaluate a game system. Uh, we used Richard Husky's Asteroid Impact. And we generally found that absolutely when people are in the flow state, they see the game as moderately cognitively demanding. You kind of expect that. It's not too hard. It's not too easy. The thing about this study that was particularly interesting, I should have made this slide actually much bigger, is that in Asteroid Impact, there's two things you have to do. You have to navigate a spaceship around a, 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 an asteroid field and collect little gems. That's the primary task. And while you're doing that, a little light flashes occasionally, and you have to hit the space bar to hit that light. Over here are the reaction times as the game got progressively harder. So in the boredom condition, the asteroids are super slow, and it's just very easy to play. You can easily allocate attention to both spaces. And people's reaction times to that light, the idea being the quicker your reaction time, the more resource you have left over to respond to that light. In the boredom condition, people can do both just fine. You see they even got a little slower as they started kind of focusing on the game, but then they got back to attention just fine. And in the flow condition, the game adjusts to your play. So you would expect it to be in the middle and not a lot of variation. And sure enough, it was like moderate response times, and they don't really change that much because the game is always adjusting to you. In the, in the hard condition, where the asteroids are nearly impossible to, to avoid, super slow reaction times, because in the beginning, People are trying their best to not get hit by an asteroid. At some point, the pl look how fast they got with their reaction time. They got good at light blinking. That was the only thing that was rewarding. Because it was either continue to be destroyed by asteroids, <laughs> or forget it, I'm doing this. It's kind of like when we're in class and, and we're not learning something. We're like, forget it, I'm doing this. It's cognitive offloading. How many video games require you to do more than one thing at a time? This might be really important to designers and developers, especially when folks get distracted. You might be able to see this cognitive offload you know, in action. And it might be tracing back to these perceptions of demand. 
We looked at streaming where we had novices, people who don't stream, come in a lab, play a first person shooter, and either play, they played the game, and in one condition, my students were in the back making up fake commentary as the audience watching the game. And the other conditions, they weren't doing that. We just used like a generic script for like computer code to control the stimulus on screen and all of that. Well, in this situation, it turns out that you would think they were aware they were being watched. The social facilitation notes I thought would happen here. They're being watched by an audience. They can recall that audience. They didn't feel any social demand. And the reason, I think, is quite simple. The game's too damn hard. You gotta focus on the game. So yeah, they could see the content. They can even recall like specific messages, but they were focused on, on the game. And so a big sales pitch for streaming is like this power of the audience to watch you. And I'm wondering if there's something missing in that equation. Obviously, you might expect a different result for professional streamers who love to perform in front of each other. But that was something we're coming across. And so we're seeing again this sort of when the demands might con conflict, people make a choice. Where I'm going with all of this, and I'll go back here for a minute, I don't think folks can have high levels of all of these if you want a positive experience. I think they start to try to shunt some off and do others. But you can do that in an interactive experience. Or maybe as designers, we have to let you be able to do that in an interactive experience. Looking at Beat Saber, we adjusted the field of view. So there's, you know, this, this Saber game. And you get to look straight forward, and these blocks come at you. You have to cut them and move out of the way. You have to rotate 90 degrees and see the blocks. Or you have to rotate 360. And as you increase that field of vision, people did see it as increasingly cognitively demanding and increasingly exertionally demanding. And the other three dimensions, I always measure them just as controls and to make sure the scale is not bumped. No differences, pretty low as you would expect. Well, the cognitive demands helped enjoyment. That's the fun part of the game. Small sample, right? But the exertional demands seem like they might potentially disrupt enjoyment. I want to have fun. I don't want to sweat the whole time. This could be, and this is what we need to do more work with. We got cut off during COVID. Um, but we're starting to see that we didn't find differences in the relative demands between the two of these and the reasons are real simple It's not 360. It's actually 90 and then 90 and then 90 so nothing ever comes behind you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Whereas real 360 beyond looking at Gary as a car behind me. I have to pay attention to that right? I'm not sure we understand as I get towards the end whether it's gaming or interactive narratives, how to tell stories in rectangles on the left versus stories in spheres, right? So we're seeing a huge move towards uh, uh, pro-social storytelling to get people involved in the lives of others through VR, the, what Milk calls the empathy machine. But we presume that the VR is needed for the experience. So like in this one here, great, you're letting me look around a school which is kind of distracting, and I can look around my environment, but I don't know what I'm looking at. And I'm actually losing the message. And we're seeing data from, from our research team, from a couple of other research teams, to where the spherical storytelling is distracting. People don't pay attention to the message. They definitely feel present. And we are finding empirically, this is gonna make a lot of people mad on the, on the YouTube-verse, presence, and narrative engagement are not the same thing. <laughs> there's being in a space, and there's being in a story, and they're not one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we can show it to you with data. Tilo's got some data. Miguel Boyer has some data. Over the last, uh, I think Grace Ahn has some data on this. And I think it's a mistake we're making. We just assume if I give you a headset, you'll be in the story to donate more money. And we're not finding that. We're just finding you feel like you're in the environment. I was a student of West Virginia did a dissertation on drunk driving videos, and the same thing. You can be in the car when the drunk driving accident happens, but you're not any closer to the characters. You just feel like you're in the car. I think it might be something to do with demands. You're focusing so much on doing this that you don't have the resources left over for other things. And the storytelling mechanic isn't one-to-one. -one. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It means you have to be more careful with it. It's not as simple as just putting a headset on. You may have to have some markers. You may have to have some other uh, bogus talks about procedural rhetoric, where the interactivity is the thing you're trying to learn. They're, they're one and together. Right? 
um, watching VR advertisements, we find out that when you watch them with just uh, AI avatars, you're more likely to pay attention to the product, you're more likely to remember it, and we found this both in an experiment and with industry data across, uh, I think, 80,000 users. If you drop little agents into the environment while you're watching an ad, the people will pay more attention. They won't skip the ad. So if you're HTC, you're trying to sell ad space in VR, it turns out you just create a couple of little avatars <laughs> and put them in the room. And I'm wondering that there might be some social domain characters expanding. Right? They actually feel like my, little, my buddies for a little while. Um, again, conflicts. What happens in an experience when I've got to climb a wall and save somebody? Can I pay attention to both at the same time? Are there conflicts here that I can't reconcile? Or do I have to choose one or the other? Or what many games do is they just give you one and not the other. And they switch back and forth. Great example here is a game called Detroit Become Human, incredibly emotionally intense, and what they usually do, this is how you play the game. You talk them off the wall by pushing the X button, which is very different than getting on the VR gloves, getting on the body suit, getting on the treadmill, and, and heading over there, right? I think this is an example of the developers balancing demands. So you could focus on the narrative and the characters and not pay so much attention to the physical aspects of the controllers. Um, and then, you know, more of the same in the last study I'm working on right now, taking it all the way back home. Let's go back to that dissertation. Let's go back to mood management, interactivity, and how much of my attention is caught up in the message. And we already know that this happens with, like, you know, the, the uh, non-symmetric facilitable interaction. But what if we added the VR headset? Is that, that looks fun, but it's probably an additional source of demand. I gotta whip my head around and pay attention to all this while driving the car, while shifting gears, while managing the clutch and the brake and the gas. And I'm gonna bet if I went back to that Bowman and Tabor 2012 paper and added these layers, you would find that that might be really good folks who are bored. So it was even more attention pulled from their, their noxious mood state. But I bet for those stressed people, that's about the worst thing you could do. Mm -hmm. Is promise them an immersive experience. And they may not know that, because you know, it's not working out. So where does all this go? Well, first, I need to thank Chuck. And in fact, um, I saw this hat on campus. I don't know. It just looked like one that he would wear, like driving that convertible. So I wasn't going to say I know I saw that, and I was like, it's exactly the kind of like lid I could see him wearing down the building. The day I got invited here, I found a book of his that I should probably give back to the John Miller Lab. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a letter from annual giving from Dean probably Godwin. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stick that in there. <laughs> and I brought a, I actually brought the book that we did, and I say it's not really mine, frankly, because Allison's in it, and Ron's in it, and Rafe is, and Dave is in it. A lot of people in this room are in this volume. And I would like to say I'm being charitable, but it's because they gave me like a box of these. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to give that back. I really owe this place a lot. And this work is still trying to find its way. I actually struggled to find a closing slide and a closing narrative, like a closing summary, because it's very much open-ended. You know, for me, I suppose it would be a combination of this. If nothing else stuck, I think it's trying to decompose our interactive experience somewhere along these lines. You'll note that I didn't include individual differences, but you can see how they could very easily slide their way into these paths. I have a measurement model that's not perfect, but it's pretty good at measuring these things. And we all know how to look at features and how to look at outcomes. And that's been my contribution that we're still working on. And I'd like to continue doing that. And the other one I'd leave you with is that I really want to stay in touch. All right. Okay. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm happy to ask questions. <laughs> Is that hat orange? It is incredibly orange. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you how orange this hat or that campus is. <laughs> incredibly orange. <laughs> All right. It's a truck hat. It's a truck hat. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the yeah. way. Uh, there was something about, because there's a blue one. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. No, the orange one. <laughs> I liked it. What outcomes are you, what, what outcomes are you most interested in? That's a good question. So 
Lately, the foldable outcomes that I've been most interested in have actually been going more towards like uh, empathy and pro-social change. Um, and we're, the reason I bring that one up is I think it starts to bring up the clash of the emotional and social with the other. Um, and I want to know if there is a, a sweet spot of sports that would actually, you know, where are the parts of demand that would interact to increase pro social change and empathy, and where are the ones that would clash? That brings me to the question I really want to know. <laughs> and that is whether or not the uh, technical therapist, the technological therapist at the front of the model, the formal features in the focal outcomes, right? might interact in a way to change the way they're mediated by the organism. So for example, different types of focal outcomes, if I'm looking at empathy as a focal outcome, but there are other types of focal outcomes that would be completely different from empathy, right? That perhaps would be related to formal features differentially. And so the relationship between the formal features and the outcomes are likely to be really different depending upon, the formal features are kind of fixed, right? Right. But the outcomes are varied. If you, you, you can look at all different types of focal outcomes, that's why I started to ask you that first. And with different focal outcomes, you would expect, well, the features are still kind of fixed, and they might, you might expect them to be related to, you know, to the focal outcomes kind of the same way, because even if the outcomes are different, right. but the way that the, uh, the different types of demand would mediate the relationship between the features and the focal outcomes might have a lot to do with how certain features just are inherently related to different types of outcomes. Yeah, sure, and you know, it's a classic, when you draw a mediation model, you're sort of forcing this idea of complete mediation, which is not often what's going on here, right? So it's a fair point. Uh, a related one is that I'm not sure it's linear, always. So then let me go back. What, yeah. what, type, of form, what type of formal features are you focusing on? So, for example, we're looking at uh, controllers. That could be right. an example of a formal feature, right? Or if we're looking at the presence of your avatar, you know, that could be a feature we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I would challenge the fact that they're set, the formal features, mm -hmm. because people, especially, that's one of the things that makes games fascinating, is that people can go in and change the formal features, either through the game mechanics or through social interactions, such okay. as with... I think the formal features are a little bit differently, but in that sense, Dave, I agree with you, yes. I think we're thinking about them fairly similar. I was talking about the technological features. Okay, okay, yeah. so we are thinking about yeah. technology. Yeah. Things like challenge, uh, the, 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 the challenge structure, the balance system in the game, things of that nature. Yeah. You know. and, and part of this is we've been trying to think of, like the project that I haven't gotten a hold of yet, but I've been in a conversation with the developer on, is this idea of are there consistent signatures? Are there like some set of features that reliably are seen as more or less demanding? Is if that isn't the case, there's some reconfiguring that has to go on here. Maybe it's too personological, which means that whether it's the outcome interacting with the demand signature or some individual differences might be more powerful than the actual you know, features themselves. You think about like mental models, for example. Um, the, the QWERTY discussion earlier is predicated on all of us having a mental model for a QWERTY keyboard. If we don't, then that's not going to work the same way. Right? So it's a fair question. It's one that and again, I, I know it sounds like sort of the, 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 the excuse of the day, but we got kind of shut down for a while, so a lot of this research got locked up, but I am hoping to see that we have some reliable correspondence. One good example, though, field of vision. We found that you increase the field of vision of a VR game, you reliably increase its cognitive demand, and you reliably increase its, uh, its exertional demand. That'd be one example. Gary in the middle here. Um. You said we should keep apart the, um, the spatial presence, the experience of spatial presence and, let's say, narrative involvement. Uh, so I think that's a good starting point. But <clears throat> I also can imagine that they have certain uh, sweet spots where they overlap and come together. So yeah. maybe just uh, an example, and then I want to ask you where you think this happens. Some 25 years ago, we did a study on a movie called Cyber Heidi which was a 3D movie with this, you know, this green and, and red goggles, you could watch the 3D, and it existed in 2D and 3D. And we had physio data and, you know, no difference, except for one, one situation where Heidi looked down into the valley from the cliff, you know? So there are just functionalities where spatial presence is part of the narrative. And if you read a book, okay. these yeah, are the, sure. the pages where the, the author will just give you every detail of how deep and how, you know, kind of threatening it is. 
So I would say yes and no. Um, maybe this is the important thing to think about. Where is it functional for, this, for the narrative? That first note, I think that's a better, you've actually helped crystallize something that I've been trying to formulate, is does the space play a role in the experience? So the research on all talks about this. Like, you it wouldn't depends. expect all if the Grand Canyon wasn't central to the experience, because you would hope the person's resources are allocated towards the experience. We see it in games as well, where um, you know, if I'm uh, if I'm not the driver, if I could be the passenger for a moment, I can devote space to this. But if the stuff that's supposed to increase all is way in the background, it's not going to matter. So I love the point that it's not that they can't go together; it's that they don't inherently go together. But there probably is something in the narrative to where the space is the story. You know, it's part of the reinforce. That's a really good point. Yeah, I like that a lot. Actually, that helps explain my frustration. Well, to that uh, that video earlier, it's probably the case that the high school lobby wasn't important to that narrative. So when these folks spent all this money 3D filming a high school and couldn't figure out why people didn't want to donate any more money to the high school between flat and 3D, it's because the lobby wasn't relevant. Yeah. Look at the Avatar movie. Yeah. Just watch it again. It's just wasted 3D in many moments. For its own sake. But when they start flying, it's not wasted anymore. And that's, that's easily testable, right? Like to your point of the, your, your study, and in gaming especially, it wouldn't be hard to find those moments. Yeah. And cut them in, cut them out. I mean, that wouldn't be hard to do at all. That's a good point. Thank you for that. Absolutely. That answers maybe even the question about uh, um, uh, increasing empathy. Yeah. So I'm curious if there's like a way to tell the difference between the things that you said that with virtual reality, something that we're finding is some people, the immersion can like stress them out. It puts on too much demand, or maybe an additional demand to some of these demands. And I'm thinking right now that the driving simulator that you showed mm -hmm. that has all the like there's a visually and like probably auditorily um, immersive experience in that. They're also controlling the wheel and the gas pedal and the brake and the clutch. What if? that visual and auditory immersion was there, but they were given a controller that they're used to playing a driving game with. And that's actually, if we can finally get the study off the ground, that's the hope, is that uh, we can separate out wearing a headset and not wearing a headset versus using a standard uh, handheld golden hands controller versus an apparatus like that. Um, I don't think I, I think, yeah, I guess I did model it over here. Um, that would be the hope in the study, is that we would cross those two things. The functional problem with it is that the original study design was already a 4 by 2 I think so. By 2 <laughs> And, uh, you know, but, I mean, that's not an excuse, right? I mean, we have to do the research. And uh, that's my, that's what I was hoping to find out. That's kind of why I think that study would be interesting. Because you could, I think that... The VR, the, uh, I, didn't mo I didn't actually map it there very well at all. I, I had to find a way to map that with the extra controllers. My suspicion, well, and this kind of gets to Ron's note, not everybody's going to do that. Some folks are going to look straight forward. Huh, this is why study two isn't published, if you remember. Because I had thought that more of this would be more demands. No. If you're doing good, you're going to be very smooth. Yeah. You're going to be very smooth and very controlled. So this was a bit of a hitch in the, in the logic, right? It could be the case that a lack, and of course, so this is reinforcing another lesson. Don't forget the data you didn't even realize you were collecting, right? Because in this case, if somebody is focused forward, that might be an, in, an indicator of a different type of engagement than the person that's doing this. Whether it's, think about cognitive offloading. If I'm not very good at driving this car, I might just start looking around because that's more interesting than me not driving very well. But to your point, the study would need to have all three of those things. And I can think a little more deeply about just the main effects of the VR separate from the control system and how they would matter. Because the control system, the Ron's and with Allison, that one is pretty fixed, but the VR one isn't. The only thing fixed in the VR is that you have a stereoscopic vision. You still have to use it however you're going to use it. And so there's a degree of freedom in the player that is proving to be a little bit elusive. 
but it's a good point. Yeah. I was told this has to be quick as we were wrapping it up, because I don't think this is a quick question, so maybe you can just... I can do this. Um, so, you talk about a lot of different sort of types of demand, and I just wonder if you could maybe noodle for a hot second on like what is being demanded, like what is the resource, right? Because you've talked about social, emotional, mm -hmm. exertional, and then you've talked about these, ex so those are all internal to the, the user, right? And you talked about external demands, yeah. like controller demands, uh, challenges in the game, story time challenges. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? So you yeah, have like, two sources there, and I'm trying to reconcile that with a single unitary resource. Same here. Um, so this is part of where the physiological application and extension is going to be really important. I give a quick answer, and I give a longer one later. I would like to think, if we're coming at it from more of, a couple, of more of an attentional processing model, that it's all related to attention in some way. And that the thing you're perceiving is what element of that feature pulled my attention broadly construed. And then the way I give that attention requires different mechanisms. It's all about cognitive attention, which is limited in bandwidth, which might manifest in different ways. That's how I've been working to codify this. I'm a little behind the curve in some of, in some of the deeper cuts there. That's where I think it's going. It's not so much that they're like actual types of demand. We're just, we're, we're how do I say, or how do I say this? Uh, different types of attention. We either give attention or we don't, right? But it's how we go about actually doing that thing. That's the best answer I have right now. I'm still playing with this a little. Because in some way, I have to allocate something and then make it happen. And sometimes that's going to be, you know, this, and sometimes that's going to be some other type of reaction. And I think what people are responding to is their perceptions of what, what uh, caused that, right? And they're probably giving essentially a lay explanation of what's going on in here, if that makes any sense. We're this in the is, middle of greeting it all out, and we just haven't gotten that far yet. That, that this for all of you here, that was a quick explanation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've been asked, I've been asked to wrap things up because we're a little bit late. But let me just tell a truck story on the way and get this out. Yeah. Well, I don't know about putting it on. All right. <laughs> I have a huge head, so I'm not sure it will fit me. But um, Chuck would um, always say that he would take all the resources that we have that he possibly could for graduate students. And he would give them the money to travel. They got more travel money than we did as faculty members. Don't know if you faculty members knew that, but it's true. And I asked him one time, what, what's that all about? And he said, these graduate students are the future of our department. They're the reputation of our department. They're going to take us forward and go out and show people everything that we're all about. And he always called it the MSU Mafia. And um, I think we can see today that he was right. These have been three fantastic uh, presentations and it's really heartwarming to see where everybody's taken the common knowledge that they gained here. So let's give everybody a big hand.